so this, this uh, tweet was written uh, maybe about three months ago by Lego. Um, I'm going to read it to you real quick. It says, we are super excited to introduce Lego Braille Bricks, a new product from the Lego Foundation that will help blind and visually impaired children learn Braille in a playful and inclusive way. So below the tweet was a video, and I'm actually going to share that video with you right now. Maybe. <laughs> there it is. Okay, so can we bring the audio down a little bit? So as, as we're watching this video, I want you to ask yourself, how does this video make you feel? Are you feeling inspired? Are you feeling empathy? Is your faith restored in humanity? Um, do I have any blind friends in the audience? It's funny, I, um, I've, I've shown this video a few times and I have yet to encounter uh, any blind people in the audience, even though many of my d d design friends are actually blind, um, so we do exist. But if there was a blind person in the audience, they're gonna tell you something different. They might tell you this video makes them angry, that they feel exploited. Why? Right? There's no audio. There's no audio. How could they possibly know what was in it? This video, it may have been about them, but it sure as hell wasn't for them. Let's check out another ad. Uh, have any of you seen this, this ad? It was uh, Nike signed their first ever disabled athlete. Has anybody seen this? Um, well, the video felt really, really good to people who watched it. But it's actually not even four seconds into the ad when Nike, it's not clicking through. Sorry. Um, well, it'll click through. It's not even four seconds through when Nike um, tells us that, um, that Justin suffers from cerebral palsy. Uh, and this is on World Cerebral Palsy Day. Um, and again, I feel like this actually relies on the slide, so there it goes. So Nike's telling us that Justin su uh, suffers from cerebral palsy. They announced this on cerebral, World Cerebral Palsy Day. Um, and if the clicker worked, there it is. But does this look like somebody who is suffering to you? Right, what Nike didn't realize was um, that, um, I'm so sorry, this has got me a little bit distracted. Um, but the thing is, is if you Google signing day, um, hmm. I'm, just give me one second. Uh, so as the, as the ad progresses, we learn Nike's signing uh, Justin with a, a professional contract. But if you Google signing day, what you're gonna see is, is image after image of athletes sitting at a table with a pen in hand being treated as a professional. Because this is what this is, right? It's a professional contract. Nike didn't realize that what they were telling us is that they didn't actually see Justin as a valuable signee. The simple act of turning a professional contract into a gift tells us that Nike thinks it's their charitable gesture that creates value. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is probably not a message that you would actually want to send to disabled people. But again, if you really watch this ad, you would realize that disabled people weren't the intended audience. Everyone else was. Nike was simply using us to inspire you. This is actually why I started my design talk to you today by talking about um, how brands depict their interactions with us. Because what happens is, is when a designer gets a design brief about disability, what they do is, is they go online and they search disability and design, and the things that come up aren't actually things that disabled people are saying. What comes up are these, these stigmatizing interactions. So what my organization did is, is we created um, a website called Critical Access. Uh, and what Critical Access is, is it's a repository of disability representation in media. So what we've been doing is, is we've been uploading ads to this website. Uh, if you look at the upper right, uh, at the logo, you'll see that the upper right hand corner is filled in. And the reason this is, is, is because Critical Access is actually a matrix. Um, and what we've done is, is we've put in a whole bunch of disability tropes that are all rooted in disability studies. And if you look at the matrix, you'll see at the top is amplifying, the bottom is stigma, the left side is traditional, and the right side is an emerging. This is why we actually uh, filled in the upper right-hand quadrant is, is because we want brands to aspire to reaching this upper right-hand quadrant in their ads. The thing that we didn't realize when we began creating this is, is that we were creating a data set. Um, but we quickly realized some interesting and frightening to us trends. 
One of the first things that we began to do when we realized we were creating a data set is we went through all of the ads and we counted the amount of words a disabled person speaks. We then went on to YouTube and we then organized and analyzed the comments. And one of the first trends we realized is, is that the more words a disabled person speaks, the less believable the ad is perceived to be. Um, there's other trends that we've, we've actually started tracking now. One of them is, is that brands frequently use uh, disability as a marketing ploy. So what they'll do is, is they will uh, go and they will announce a, um, an initiative. Um, and, and what happens is, is they get a lot of good PR from the initiative. And then after they get that PR, they're no longer incentivized to follow through with the initiative. Uh, and so what we've been doing is, is tracking brands that announce things but never actually do them. Uh, and there's another really big one, which is that a lot of brands actually um, claim to be the first, um, which ultimately serves to uh, erase a lot of disabled people. Um, oh, also, if you actually go onto the Critical Access website, you'll realize that there's no ads that feature a disabled person of color. I think advertising hasn't quite realized that disabled people of color exist. Um, so, but back to the, the, um, the, the trend about uh, claiming to be the first, thus erasing disabled people. So, um, a couple of years ago, I happened across uh, a disabled fashion designer from the 1950s. Her name was Helen Cookman, and she wrote this book called Fun Functional Fashions for the Physically Handicapped. Um, and in the book, you go through, and what you realize is all these, all these things that we are actually sort of construing as adaptive fashion right now were actually created by Helen back in the 1950s. Um, but what you have is, is brand after brand coming out, uh, Tommy Hilfiger, Zappos, um, Target, and every time they come out with an adaptive brand, they say that they're the first, thus erasing everybody that came before them. And this is actually why um, so many disability scholars such as Chansey Fleet, Meryl Alper, uh, and Cynthia Bennett were so frustrated with the Lego tactiles, or the Lego bra braille bricks um, um, uh, advertisement. So if you look at this image, this shows you the Lego braille bricks. Um, but if you actually look at this image, what you're seeing is something called Lego, uh, it's, it's actually called tactiles. And this, it, these tactiles were created by a blind family uh, in the 1980s. And so when, when uh, Lego came out with the Lego Braille Bricks and claimed to be the first, they ultimately, not only did they erase all the work of tactiles, but they essentially put uh, the tactiles family out of business. And this is actually how it continuously happens, is, is the things in disability that we radically fight for never cease to turn into things that are empathetically done for us. So I created something called the WITH Fellowship. The thing that I started realizing was, is if you go onto Google and you type in the phrase design for disability, you'll discover that it yields more than 10 times as many search results as disability design. Um, this idea that we are recipients of design has embedded itself into our language, um, but it's quite simply not true. Um, does anybody here use uh, finger works? No? So uh, back in 1998, there was this guy, his name was Wayne Westerman, and he had some carpal tunnel and some tendonitis, but he decided he wanted to create a technology that would allow him to continue working. And so he created something called Fingerworks. And then in 2005, Steve Jobs bought it. It's the iPhone touchscreen, right? So who here uses Fingerworks? Right? So this idea that we are recipients of design is quite simply not true. If you look throughout history, what you realize is, is that it's actually disabled people who are creating world-changing innovations. It is us that invented the bicycle. We created the internet, the iPhone touchscreen, email, cruise control, curb cuts, the, the list goes on and on, right? But we are perceived as recipients. So I created the WITH Fellowship as in Design with Disability. And something really interesting started happening pretty quickly, which is that brands would come up to me and they'd say, oh, so you're talking about co-design, right? With is co-design, and I said, no. No, with is not co-design at all. With is the antithesis of co-design, right? So what's the difference? Right? Well, in co-design, it's the institutions and it's, it's the people in power who get to decide when and how a disabled person is included. But with, with is a disabled person uh, inserting themselves into the process. Early on with the WITH Fellowship, I made a rule for myself where I uh, wouldn't tell stories about WITH Fellows to validate our successes with the fellowship because this is one of the many ways in which disabled people, our stories, tend to be used to exploit us. 
Uh, well, what happened was, is, and see, now I'm telling a story about the With Fellow. So what happened is, is one of the With Fellows was asked to do a podcast um, about her work. Um, she's a really talented designer. And uh, as she was doing the podcast, she happened to mention me. And so she asked if they would also interview me for the podcast. And I was thinking to myself, and I realized, well, if she's already like, going to be in the podcast, I have this story. It's a really good story, one that I'm not going to tell you. I have this really good story that I'm going to tell about her. So I tell the story, and what I didn't realize happened afterward was is that they had called her back in to interview her again. And what I inadvertently had done was, is when I, I realized when the podcast came out, was I had actually um, shifted the story so that she had become a recipient of my good deed. So we have to be really, really careful about the ways that we depict disability, which is why it's so important to analyze and, and, and push back on these dynamics, because when we do, something like this happens, where Lego changes, right? So this is a tweet from a couple of weeks ago. They say, everybody should be able to enjoy Lego play, which is why we are excited to launch Lego audio, Braille, audio and Braille instructions. For more information, visit this website. So again, like the first ad, um, this one also had uh, a video, which I'm gonna play for you here. These blind children are building using Lego audio and Braille instructions. A free service that gives visually impaired people a new way to build. Enjoy. So if you could bring the audio the all the way off. The were inspired by Matthew Schifrin. So Matthew Schifrin is a disabled designer who had approached Lego about an idea, right? And now not only did Lego add audio descriptions to the video, but they also credited Matthew Schifrin, right? And so this is the work that I'm very, very focused on doing. And the thing that I have been endlessly focused on is getting IDEO to pay attention. So um, I have been telling a particular story for well over a year now, and I'd gotten sort of sick of the story. But a couple of weeks ago, I was at an event, and uh, some people from IDEO were working there, and I discovered I'm basically famous within IDEO. And so now I just tell the story with even more gusto. So a couple of years ago, um, IDEO had approached me. They said that they wanted to show me something, so they invited me to come into the office. I go into the office and they basically say to me, we have created this technology that's intended to get disabled people hired. And I said, great, what disabled people did you hire to create this technology that's intended to get disabled people hired? And they were basically like, none, right? And then they showed me the door. Um, and I was pissed. Um, and I started thinking about it, and what I realized was is that I actually feel like design thinking may actually be the problem, um, right? So what, what is design thinking? The way that I understand it is it's, it's the, an approach to design. Um, it happened in about the 1960s when you had a group of really, really powerful white men, right? These are the people who are at the top of their profession. They are aligned with the greatest institutions in the world, and they're creating products that fill the homes of millions of people all over the world. And they started realizing that design wasn't reaching everybody, so they created a system built on empathy to fill in those gaps. Um, and the thing that I argue is, is that while much good has come from design thinking, it has inadvertently fueled this narrative that we are recipients rather than drivers of design. So I have begun proposing an alternative, which I call design questioning. Um, and what I believe is, is when we are finally able to question the systems that disable us, everyone involved stops seeing our bodies as the problem. So how do you, you do design questioning? Well, my understanding is, is uh, design questioning looks at design thinking from the user's perspective. So in step one, right, in step one of design thinking, what we do is, is we cultivate empathy through observations and interviews. But if you were to actually speak to a disabled person, what you would find is, is that this, this step feels a little bit less like empathy and a little bit more like designers are gleaning our ideas and our life hacks, and then they're using those to, and they're selling them back to us as inspirational do-good without ever actually giving us credit. Uh, it makes me think of the story of, of OXO kitchen products. Do you, you know OXO? It's, they're, they have like these gummy tactile handles. Um, up until about a week ago, thanks to me, uh, if you were to go on the website, you would see a story about uh, Sam Farber, right? Sam Farber saw that his wife, who had arthritis, was having a hard time peeling a carrot. 
Um, so he decided he was going to create a better peeler for her to use. So he created OXO Kitchen Products. OXO has been heralded as the universal example of universal design. Uh, I work in an office in New York City. I happen to sit across from this guy that I lovingly refer to as the world's most industrial designer. His name is Tucker Veermeister. Um, and he invented the grip. He invented the good grips. And this one day, I, I, I was thinking about it, and I realized I'd never heard much about Sam's wife, Betsy. And so I asked Tucker, I said, Tucker, can you, can you tell me about Betsy? And Tucker said to me, oh, yeah, did you know she was a designer? I said, no, I did not know she was a designer. He said, yeah, she was around all the time. And I started thinking about it, and I realized I don't know a single designer that would just let her husband inspirationally just make a peeler for her. So I pick up the phone and I call Betsy, and the thing she says to me is, is I'm gonna go down in history as being Sam's lowly crippled wife, and this was actually my idea in the first place. So that's step one. Step two of design thinking is defining the problem, right? But because disabled people are not actually invited to this process, it oftentimes becomes us that's defined as the problem, rather than the problem being defined as the problem, right? So you have our insights gleaned, we are defined as the problem, and then designers enter an iterative process of ideation, prototyping, and testing, which leads to what I call the unacknowledged sixth step of design thinking, or as I call it, design thanking, because we are expected to be grateful for that which has been done for us. Right? So, like, I'm still pissed at IDEO, right? I'm like, you losers. And so I've got, right, this whole kind of premise on, on design questioning, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, yeah, well, what if it's not actually design thinking that's the problem? What if it's actually empathy, right? Like, I think we may be losing the plot here, right? This is wine that is sold by a venture capitalist um, for like 60 bucks a pop, uh, and you ask them, do you have empathy for the user? Do you have empathy for the seller? Oh, I have empathy for both. Mm -hmm. So anyway, what is empathy, right? So there's a really good book that I recommend. It's called You Must Change Your Life. And it tells the story of Rilke and Rodan and their relationship. And one of the things that actually came out of it was is there is a psychologist. His name is Theodore Lips, right? He, was, he lived in this, this community at the time. He was Freud's mentor. And what Theodore Lips discovered was is that when a person goes into a museum and they encounter a great work of art, right, what do they do? right? Well, they may, they may tug at their collar, and they might put their hand on their chest and, they, and step back, or they might sway. The thing that he realized is that people are physically moved by works of great human expression. Um, and so he created a term, and the term was called Einfühlung, and that's quite simply what it meant. It meant physically moved by works of great human expression. Um, and the term took off in Germany, um, and it eventually made its way to America. And, and when it came to America, not only did the word shift from Einfühlung to empathy, but the definition shifted, and it stopped meaning feeling physically moved by works of great human expression, and it started meaning feeling um, sympathy, or in the case of disability, we experience it as pity uh, for a person's situation or circumstance. And so for the, the, me, the thing that was so striking is, is that as empathy was shifting from right, inspiration to pity, at the same time, I feel like disability was shifting from pity to inspiration. And I think in this process, we've lost the capacity to glean and really parse out one emotion from the other. And so when I think about it, I realize this leads to three outcomes. The first is, is that it reifies class and power structures, right? So you always have the empathizer, and then you have what I sort of call the empathizee, right? But it's the empathizer, it's, the, it's the, the brand that gets to depict the interactions and, and to tell the story of this empathy. You never hear from the empathizee. The second thing it does is it prescribes emotions. And this is as far as I've kind of come to understand it is, is that we have convinced ourselves that things that feel a certain way do a certain thing, but they don't, right? I would even go so far as to say that things that feel a certain way oftentimes prevent us from doing things that do a certain thing. And the last thing it does is it silences the recipient. And when I reflect on my own experiences over the last few years, the thing I realize is, is that questioning systems has done a whole lot more for me than empathy ever could have, right? I mean, Thyssen was nothing but a fuck you, right? And so, right, but it turned into something, and there was no empathy in the process. It was just simply wanting to clarify a situation. 
Interestingly, I was at 99U just watching. Uh, we were running this in there. And so I'm sitting there, and I, I see the feed in front of me. And, and, and Tim Brown, the, um, the, he, at the time he was the CEO of IDEO, he was um, participating in a QA. and a um, and I've, it's really struck me as interesting that he'd gotten, right, this is the guy who the, he spent the last 30 years of his career popularizing design thinking. And he had gotten, you know, 10, 15 minutes into this, this Q&A, he had never once said design thinking. And uh, that was until the interviewer actually asked him about it. And this is what he said. He said, so unless we popularize design methods and design approaches and we use the convenient term design thinking even though I think it has lots of downsides to it. And I was like, you turd. You think the term has downsides, not the methodology? But then I got curious and I realized maybe he's right. The term thinking does have a lot of downsides, right? We are told from the moment that we enter our first design course to think of, think of, think of. But all the while, we're actually being taught something completely different. Through mantras like usability, we're actually being taught to think for, as though we've become these Vitruvian god-like creatures, and that simply by entering this profession, we become the arbiters of all that is good and just. And in all of this, if there's one thing I've learned, it's this. Thinking is elitist. Think about it. No, don't think, question. Right? Who gets to be in a think tank? Who gets to be a thought leader? Who gets to be a design thinker? And are we really doing the thinking or are we just getting the credit? This is why I engage in disability as a creative practice. The world has taught us that a disabled body is nothing more than a body in need of intervention. And this is exactly what designers do. We design interventions. We dedicate our careers to it. We are here today because of our commitment to this process. We are seekers who develop our skills with rigor because we oftentimes want to be the best. There is a certain glory in being a designer. And so I see the natural progression. Of course, we're going to want to take our highly attuned skills and apply them to something that we think needs fixing. But I am someone who straddles both sides. I am a disabled designer. And while solutions feel fulfilling to me as a designer, as a disabled person, this process feels destructive. It's as though we've become a project or a topic um, instead of a discipline or a craft. Where is the rigor? Design schools are beginning to teach accessibility curriculum. But in lieu of creativity, students are, being are learning disability through compliance checklists. But that's not design. As I've been taught, design is art. Well, art with rules. And if compliance is the rules, where is the art? And that's actually where I come in, right? The art is in the disability culture. It's in the history. It's in the knowledge and in the theory. People don't realize that a person can feel passion and love for disability. Disability is something a person can endeavor in. Disability can be a practice, a creative practice. But design schools aren't fostering relationships with people who engage in disability as a creative practice, and so a culture is being created where students don't think that they need to build real relationships with actual disabled people. They think they just need to feel empathy for us. And this is actually why I've taken such a career in this idea of design education. So when I created the WIF Fellowship, uh, one of the top design uh, schools reached out to me and they said to me, do you want your, our disability numbers? And I said, sure, of course I want them. And before they even sent them to me, I knew two things. The first thing I knew was, is that in the United States and in Canada, about 11% of any college population is disabled, right? Um, but the other thing I knew was, is I knew how they got these numbers, right? These aren't students that identify as disabled. These are students that go through a highly stigmatizing process of requesting accommodations, right? So how does a student do that? Well, the first thing they do is, is they go to their doctor and they get a note. They then take that note to student services and they go through a completely demeaning process where they have to prove that they require X and Y accommodation. And if they are granted that accommodation, they then have to hand deliver a note to their teacher and therefore they have stigmatized themselves in this classroom. So I also sort of fundamentally believe that 11% number is a little bit low. Um, but um, I was shocked when I got these numbers. Um, it was, um, the numbers they sent me were about three times the national average. Um, there were departments, like graphic design was one, where it was just, it was, it was just sky high. Um, and I started thinking about it, and, and I, this is what I realized, right? I, I understood 
for the first time that of course disabled people, even though we don't seem present, we are entering design and creative fields at much higher rates, right? Disabled people, we are the original life hackers. We spend our lives cultivating an intuitive creativity because we are forced to navigate a world that is not built for our bodies, right? Of course, we're gonna want to um, benefit from this process, right? So if that is the reason that dis disabled people are entering this process, then it left me with two questions. The first question was is, what is happening to these students year after year? And the thing that I believe and the thing that I'm hoping to prove is, is that these are the students who aren't getting their needs met, and so these are actually the students that are dropping out year after year. And then the second question I had is, is what happens to these students after they graduate? And I fundamentally believe these are the students that are falling through the cracks. I mean, when is the last time you encountered a disabled creative director? I don't have a lot of peers in this work. And so the thing I started realizing beyond that was is that it's actually not just the disabled students that aren't getting their needs met. There's actually a whole other subset of students that is, is completely being deprived of everything that they need. And those are students that have taken an interest in disability but have absolutely no resources at their disposal. And so what I've been doing is, is I've been going into design schools and I've been advocating to incorporate disability studies curriculum into these design schools because what happens is, is if you have disability studies curriculum in design schools, you create a space for these two groups of students to come and to meet each other's needs so that when they graduate, they ultimately enter their professional careers not thinking that you design for a disabled person, but you design with a disabled person. And all of my work is aimed toward one thing, which is that I want to be able to honor the friction of my disability. I don't believe we need to be fixing disabled people. We need the value of disabled people. And I like to think that if design can start investing in disabled people instead of trying to fix us, this work can be expansive. We are designers. As children, we may discover that we have a knack for design, and yet we, don't, we know that's not enough, right? We go to school and we develop our schools and we graduate and we attend events like this one here today. This is our commitment to this profession, and yet when it comes to disability, we oftentimes think we just know, but we don't. I'm gonna leave you with this story. So, a um, year ago, uh, it was a year and a half ago, it was a beautiful spring day. I was walking through New York City. It was early in the morning, I was headed to work, and I encountered the most beautiful bouquet of flowers I had ever seen in my entire life. And they were just thrown away in a trash can. And I couldn't believe it. And I was thinking to myself, who would just throw these flowers away? And so what did I do? Well, the first thing I did was I snapped this picture. And the second thing I did is I realized I'm going to save these flowers. But the cherry blossoms, right, like they were six feet tall. They were way too big. And so I was like, no but there were some tulips scattered around the bottom. And so I picked up the tulips and I took them into work. And I'm sitting there with these beautiful bouquets of tulips and I, I, I pull up my phone and I'm looking at this, this picture and I'm thinking to myself, somebody needs to save those cherry blossoms. So I go back and I, I, I get to the trash can and I tug two of the cherry blossom stems and in the process I knock the trash can over. And I'm horrified because it was so beautiful, right? And um, and I'm wearing this brand new leather jacket, and I didn't care. I hugged that New York City trash can, and I lifted it back up. But I had those two cherry blossom stems, and I, I was looking back at the trash can, and I realized it was not nearly as beautiful as it appeared when I had taken this picture. So I get back to the office, and I've got my cherry blossoms, and I've got my tulips, and I've got this picture, and I'm looking closely at the picture, and I see a hashtag. And I was like, huh. And so I go, um, I go um, on to... Instagram and I type in the hashtag and it was only then that I realized nobody had actually thrown these flowers away. This was a public art installation. <laughs> and so I was just like, like who, like, who would do this? Like, I was, I was horrified. Uh, and I started crying and, and I did the only thing I knew to do, which was I, I emailed the artist and I told him on myself and I said to him, I find myself completely overwhelmed both by the beauty and by the misguided nature of my instinct. I hope this serves as a reminder to me, a disability advocate, that not all things need saving. Sometimes they just need to exist. Thank you. I'm back, I'm back. I told you we are gonna have you sit here, we're having yeah, you sit Yeah, now we're there. switching. Everything's getting messed with. Oh, hello. Shoot, this is a relevant question. How are these chairs? Good. Yeah, I think Real so. Real good. All right. Yeah. Cool. Um, thank you. 
of course, I have to say thank you for being here. I'm really appreciating the thread that I'm getting to draw, and we talked about this backstage a little bit, but between some of what I think are seen as separate communities, so from what I'm getting from, for example, Jessica's talk I'm seeing in your talk as well, where are we looking at the system or are we looking at the person, especially when we're dealing with like uh, blame, yeah. I think. Um, so one of the questions I wanna ask you is how do you deal with guilt and apology and shame and blame that come at you as like, I feel like we spend these almost as currencies when we're confused about how to interact and we don't know what to do other than like feel bad. How do yeah. you interface with folks? It's, I mean, it is incredibly difficult for me. I, I, um, I find myself completely traumatized by this work at times. Um, there's a hashtag that I'll point everybody to. It's disability to white. Um, one of the things I realize in this space is I am very much somebody who passes. Um, and many of my disabled peers, the people that I, I admire, the people that I learn from, they don't. And so I'm able to gain access to spaces that they are not. I do everything I can to bring them along. Um, and oftentimes it is for me a decision of, it, am I doing this work a disservice by even being present you know, as somebody who passes? Um, and so it's, it's something I, I grapple with daily, um, and I feel an immense amount of guilt that I have managed to, right, because I, disability historically meant um, unable to contribute, but we live, and that's a derivative of industrialization, yeah. but we now live in a time where that's actually not the case at all, and so um, what I now see disability as is, is prevented from participating, uh -huh. and so I, in many ways, while I am, you know, able to um, have a, a voice and to, and to have a say, um, I, I am surrounded by the people that I admire the most who um, don't, and, and I don't oftentimes know what to do about that. Yeah. Well, because we have moved away from this industrialized world where you are simply a function. Yeah. And then if you can't serve that function, then you're out. You're on the side somewhere. Yeah. Um, are there communities that you're going into where there are folks who, or there are communities that are actively aware of what is required because they're employing people with, they're employing disabled folks, and then they're putting those things into practice? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's incredibly, it's incredibly complicated. I think the, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is that I think that there's a lot of initiatives in tech, um, especially that say, okay, let's hire autistic people because autistic people are really good at this specific skill set. Um, and what you realize is, is that all of those companies that do the autistic hiring are not actually run by autistic people. And, um, and so there is movements. Uh, another really good hashtag is uh, actually autistic. So there are a lot of movements around disability and employment that, um, that are just now being kind of created by actual disabled people. You know, I think the other thing that we're up against is, is, is we talk about equal pay, but we fail to acknowledge the fact that sub-minimum sub -minimum wage exists still for dis disabled people. It is still legal to pay disabled people pennies on the dollar. And so, and so you know, I, um, I don't know what it would mean for me to thrive in this field, um, knowing what legislatively is still possible for my peers. It's, um, and so in that way, you know, I think you can't really look at disability as a monolith. You know, I think we, are, um, we all have vastly different experiences, but I think the thing that really brings us together um, is, is the fight for more rights and, 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 doing, you know, and, and, and building upon the work that has been done before us and acknowledging the work that's been done before us because it's powerful. I was having to talk to some folks and didn't see the entirety of your talk. Did you talk about Google Glass? No, but I have, I have a lot of thoughts about Google Glass. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> would you like to elucidate some of them? Because um, that came up when we were talking about you coming here, and then yeah. that was something that was created to, like there was a f version of that that was created for folks with autism yeah. so that they could make eye contact the way you're supposed to. So that's deeply problematic, uh -huh. right? Um, and <laughs> Why, Liz? Why? Well, again, it's this idea of fixing. It, who cares if an, a person isn't making eye contact with you? Like, th they're happy. Like, they don't want to make, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to make eye contact with somebody that was forcing me to make eye contact with them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, um, and, you know, I think 
a lot of times the question I ask myself is, is are we actually trying to improve things for the disabled person or are we just trying to make ourselves more comfortable? Yeah. And that's the solution around trying to make some, ourselves just a little bit more comfortable. Um, there is a theorist, her name is Simi Linton, and she says that, that our discomfort from disabil disability stems from that moment that we're around somebody that is a little bit different and we don't know what to do and we panic, right? So you, uh, a deaf person with an interpreter, do you, do you talk to the interpreter, do you talk to the deaf person? A wheelchair user, do you bend down, do you stand up, what do you do? Like that's actually what creates this sense of panic and I, I think I believe that to a certain extent. Um, but like that's, it's not, it's not on disabled people, like that's on, non-disabled people to, to navigate that um, and get a little bit more comfortable with it. Um, but specifically with Google Glass, so there's this interesting guy, his name is Zubi Anwuta. Uh, he has three forms of macular degeneration and what he did is he hooked up Google Glass to I think like an EKG machine, so like he's got like a thing on his head. And what he can do is, is he can look through his Google Glass at something and what it does is it zooms in so he can see it. And so he sort of hacked Google Glass to make something that he calls think and zoom. Um, I'm working a lot with like autonomous vehicle companies um, and, and the conversation that we're having is, is that people feel a deep threat around um, uh, safety, right? And at the same time, like autonomous vehicles create access. Um, and so the thing that I'm urging uh, autonomous vehicle companies to do is, is to actually enter the market through disability um, and allow disabled people to gain access and alleviate that pain. I, I fundamentally believe if Google Glass had actually entered the market through disabled people, not trying to normalize disabled people, but actually through disabled people who benefited from this product as a form of access, I think Google Glass would be thriving today. Do companies, are, are you finding that companies are reaching out to you? Yeah, uh, increasingly uh, very much, I think. They are, um, they're hungry for this. Um, you know, th it, the case makes itself, disability is, it's an emerging $8 trillion market. It's larger than the size of China. And the, the, the thing that companies are so frustrated by is, is every time you try and poke the beast, what you do is, is you sort of strengthen the, the shell around it and also grow it even further um, and make it harder to kind of tap into. Um, and so what you have is, is you know, these, these sort of disabled academics who are really kind of figuring out, oh, this is how you tap the market. You don't do so th by trying to fix a person, but what you do is, is you do so through trying to amplify a person. And so I think companies are starting to get curious. They're also scared, so um, they usually come um, and then run for dear life, but it's fun while they try. So are they... Uh, <laughs> it's funny for us, I guess. Uh, are they approaching you because they know that they don't want to be outdated and they see, um, you know, they see it's appealing to potentially their pocketbook, but are, they, are you getting companies maybe at like a Nike level or I don't know what, um, so what did you say, automated uh, vehicle? Oh, like a, a various, yeah. Various yeah, like I'm not sure yeah. which ones you meant specifically, but are there folks who are coming to you because like from a place of heart that where they're like, oh, this is the work that we need to do, not this is what's going to make our company viable for the future, but they're like, this feels right. Are you getting that? Or are you mostly just getting like these numbers make sense? So what I get is I get advocates within companies. I get somebody who my, my work, my perspective resonates with them. Um, and so what they're doing is, is they're advocating internally. And so what I feel that I need to do on my end is give them as many tools and resources as they can to kind of go into their company and push this forward, right? We are up against a barrier every, every step of the way because um, this has never been done. And so it is a patient process. The advocates remain advocates um, and remain impassioned and, and fight for this work. And it's just a matter of me being patient and allowing them to do their work. Um, but, you know, I had sort of mentioned this in my talk, this uh, thing that happens when brands announce a, a campaign. So what happens on the inside, and I can see this coming a mile away now, is, is so what you have is, is you have those advocates in the company. And what they do is they build, they're able to build enough capital to get the idea um, into the realm of possibility. Um, and then they get it to the point where there can be an announcement around it, right? And so they then are able to convince the powers that be to announce the thing. What happens is, is they announce the thing and the powers that be then um, get the high of, of having the good PR boost. Right. But then the powers that be lose interest in the thing because they realize like, in terms, because a lot of disability is maintenance and you can't get a PR boost every time you're sort of engaging in this maintenance process. And so what happens is, is they slowly strip away the powers of the people of the, in the company that have advocated for this. And so one of the things that I actually do with the advocates is I, I advocate to them and say, 
don't talk about it, right? As soon as you talk about it, you're gonna lose every bit of traction that you have. Um, and that's really sort of the, the chess match that we're up against. So is that similar to like uh, the, what we have with touchscreen? Uh, like in an iPhone or whatever, that this was, is this correct that this was originally created because somebody needed a way to access their phone, but they were having some sort of, yeah. could you talk about that? But I don't think about that when yeah. I'm using it. I don't yeah. think about that as like something that was put in place for somebody who had a disability. Yeah, and, nor, and, and I'm not necessarily saying you should, though I, I am somebody who is really focused on rewriting a lot of these histories. Um, and I was, I was saying this to somebody upstairs. Um, one of the things that I really struggle with is this concept of design for all. Um, right, and so, right, if you look and in, in understand the history of disability, so disability is a derivative of industrialization, um, right, because this was the first time in history when bodies were expected to perform in these very rote and mechanized ways, and so suddenly there was a subset of bodies that couldn't contribute, right? That's what created our understanding of disability. It's called the medical model of disability. Um, and so what happened is, is when like the 60s and 70s rolled around and for the first time people decide that they want to address it, right, the thing that they do um, is they created something called uh, universal design. And the thing they didn't realize was is that universal design was actually recreating disability because, right, the thing that created disability in the first place was these expectations of all and normal and universal. And so, and, and so there's this thing where when I, whenever I see design for all, I'm just like, Losers, like you, you know. But there's another part too, you know, which I think is really important to acknowledge. And there's a scholar named Amy Hamray that's been doing a lot of this work. Um, but you know, when you say you design for a single person uh, and everybody benefits, what you actually serve to do is you ultimately erase the disabled person in favor of everybody else. You know, and so it's it's really destructive. Uh, Amy has sort of expanded the work to kind of express how all has become a white supremacist talking point, right? You know, all lives matter, right? Design for all, like these are actually ways that that create erasure in the communities that they sort of seek to serve. Um, and so all has become this sort of form of, the words becoming increasingly problematic. I, I love the cross section. Yeah. I, I, uh, actually, to that point, and around some of the language that we're using, um, I was asking you about, you were explaining intersection. Yeah. I, just jumping around for a second. Um, what is problematic? Because like words like diversity and inclusion yeah. and intersection, these are words that we've been using to champion a sort of uh, ethos for a few years now, but we're examining faster and faster and faster, I feel like, what is actually effective as it speaks to a system and as like a way to just get out of being a guilty party or whatever. Yeah. Um, could we explore that just yeah. term for a second? Or yeah, terms? I think, well, I think for me, this is more a personal thing. So like when okay. you talk about inclusion or diversity or intersectionality, well, what's the thing you're, that's getting left out? Well, disability, that's the thing that gets left out every time. And so I made a concerted effort to not say diversity, inclusion, intersectionality, any of those terms in my work, just simply because I'm only saying disability because somebody needs to say it. There's a really another hashtag, say the word. Um, there was a study that was done, um, it's called special needs is an ineffective euphemism. And what they found was is that when we try and talk around the word disability, we increase the stigma of it. And so I'm very much trying to get people to say the word disability. Um, what was your question? I, there was, I had an answer. Well, then there's just another piece of that, and just with the, I was, I've heard the term intersectionality a yeah. lot, and then you were talking about how that's just not a term that you use, cause yeah. if, and I was wondering if it's like too perpen, if it's like too sharp. I, well, I think for me what happens is, so, and we, well, the other thing we were talking about backstage is, is tickling, so I'm, um, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, good. You get a point for that for sure. Funny. Okay, tickling. Yeah. So how do you how do you tickle a person? Well, to tickle a person, you effectively need to create equal parts pain and pleasure. And so in my talks, the thing that I try and figure out is how is it that I can create the most amount of pain for the audience, right? And the only way I can effectively do that is if I create an equal amount of pleasure, right? I, um, I, I. I'm trying to get people a little bit uncomfortable. Like it's, it's the way that I can be effective. And so I feel like when I use terms like, like intersectionality, I think is like the biggest one for me. To me, it feels like it just, it shuts people down. I think if you're an advocate for intersectionality, you're like, yes, like, you know, this is amazing. But again, I, I think most people that really use the term don't necessarily have a way of defining it. Um, at the same time, um, if you're on the other side of it and you're like, you know, intersectionality, I don't really get it, or it's just, it's a stupid, you know, thing, like, then you shut down. And it, so it doesn't actually mean a thing. Um, 
Another thing I was saying was, is I actually really struggle when people call something brilliant, right? Because like, what happens when you're calling something brilliant? Well, I fundamentally believe that what you're doing is, is you're absolving yourself of doing the work of actually figuring out what it is that you're trying to say. Mm. Um, and so in that way, I, try, uh, the only, I, I stick with the word disability, but everything else that I do, I really try and describe it because otherwise what happens is I feel like people kind of bring in their implicit biases, but I, I, think, but I also think the work of actually digging into what I'm trying to say is where it's the richest you know, the points are to be made, I guess. I'm just excited for, especially this tickling concept and what you're talking about as it applies to this community here, because we oftentimes lean, lean into what is very pleasurable for us without looking at where the spectrum of feeling, you know? Yeah. Um, Inspiration porn. Yeah, um, I'm hoping, as we're gonna wrap up this q and I'm hoping that uh, you will continue to lean in to talk with each other. Um, and take the time to ask some of those questions. We are going to take a break for lunch, but before I announce that, even though I just did, would you one more time applaud Liz Jackson? Thank you.